I'm your host, Aaron Heath, and I take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 86 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 086. I always do a little segment in here to kind of tell you some kind of technical tip or carry tip or something like that. Well, this episode, we're going to do pressing concerns. And the pressing concerns tip for this episode is cleaning your brass allows better inspection. Some folks that reload with a progressive press may not actually look at their brass and verify that it's okay. However, cleaner brass means that your dies don't get dirty. You don't cause any damage to the carbide inserts. You don't cause damage to any coilets that are in the dies. And you don't cause damage to other items inside those dies. But the thing is, dirty brass will also hide damage to the brass. And I have a lot of brass that I have no idea how many times it's been shot when it comes to 45 auto. And I want to know what kind of shape it's in. Well, when I look at my brass, it's a lot easier to see a defect if there's no grime and residue and other soot on it. I'm able to look at the primer pocket. I found a couple of deformed primer pockets the other day that I have never seen anything like. It looked like they'd been punched two or three times when they punched the flash hole in the primer pocket. I don't know if that was the case or something else was at work there, but I had never noticed it before. With the clean brass, I actually noticed it. Now, clean brass does more than let you inspect it or keep from damaging your dies. It actually lets you uh, chamber the brass. When you chamber the reloaded cartridge, there's a chance that you might keep it from dirtying up the gun, or that's the wrong way to put it. The dirty brass may actually fail to feed as well as clean brass. So you're improving reliability as well. And finally, and a lot of people say this is the most important thing, but to me it's the most unimportant one, clean brass just looks better. Everybody's got a different way of cleaning it, and we'll talk about that in a future episode. We're actually going to throw several episodes in in the future that deal with reloading. And I don't know what I'm going to do next episode, and I'll get onto that later. However, for the moment, let me just run the audio clip that tells you how to get the show. Then we'll come back and we'll start talking about uh, show related news and f- listener feedback. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Now, I really don't have that much in the way of show news. This episode, we're going to be reviewing the STI Lawman 5.0. I had hoped to get STI on the podcast or a representative of STI on the podcast so that we could discuss it, but I just haven't been able to make it happen. And part of this is my fault. I emailed them, they replied, but I didn't see the email reply that they sent because, well, spam, my spam filter ate it. And I'm trying to refine my spam filter where it doesn't eat important emails or anything like that. But since the spam filter ate it and I missed their reply by a week or so, well, I haven't been able to reestablish contact with them and get it worked out. I I still want to get them on. I want to talk about it. But that's something that'll have to happen later. It won't be part of this episode. Now, I also want to bring into play something that I'm kind of excited about. We got a great listener feedback, and let me open that up on the computer real quick. Okay, Daniel wrote in, and, uh, ooh, okay. I just almost broke my mic boom there. I hate moving keyboards around. But anyways, Daniel wrote in. He wanted to know if this podcast has... If this podcast has any intentions of changing how it will approach the 2017 legislative session, and how will how will this podcast deal with Charles Cotton's podcast during the legislative session? Well, the truth of the matter is both podcasts are going to be active during the 2017 legislative session. No two ways about it. The thing is, we will approach it differently. Charles will be approaching it from someone's position that is involved in the process, and I will approach it like I did in the 2015 session. Needless to say, I'm not worried. It's not like you have to listen to one and not the other. It's not... I see this a lot from people that think I killed Open Carry Texas uh, little podcast they tried to get going. And the truth of the matter is, I had nothing to do with that. That was all on Open Carry Texas. 
podcast, the how do how do you put this where nobody gets their feelings hurt and nobody misunderstands it? Okay, a podcast isn't your traditional uh, show. You you're not locked into a time slot. If you have a competitor that you're actually trying to compete for the same audience, it's not so much that you are going to take that audience away from them. You're just trying to get noticed. That's kind of why I got away from the live podcasting. When you get locked into a time frame and a and a set time when you're going to be on, that's when you start hurting yourself and possibly those that people might consider to be your competition. The way I see it, the way I see it with the podcast, you don't have comp- you don't have competitors. Instead of competitors, you have cohorts. You have comrades. You have friends. You have people that well, you're doing it different than they are, but you're both doing something for the same audience. And it doesn't hurt to throw out a shout out to another podcast, which covers Sarah's email. Why would I be throwing shout outs to Charles Cotton's podcast when we're competing? We're not competing. The truth of the matter is we're both serving the same audience and it serves my audience better for me to throw Charles Cotton's podcast out there. (coughs) Excuse me. I'm not going to edit this because I am still suffering from this uh, sinus mess. While I work, we had a whole bunch of flowers in the facility, and uh, this was for Mother's Day, and my sinuses are almost at 50% of where they should be, and I'm still suffering, and it's over a week later. But anyways, I'm not competing with Charles. I'm not trying to compete with anybody else. I wasn't competing with Open Carry Texas and their little podcast. In a way, I almost wish they'd bring it back. I need the entertainment. I don't have any true comedy podcast to listen to right now that I like. And if Open Carry Texas threw theirs back out, then at least I would hear what they had to say. And I, I mean, I have to listen to theirs because it's in the same market as mine. And then I'd at least get my comedy um, quota. But moving on, I want to run the audio clip that tells you how to find the show on social media. Then I want to come back and we're going to launch into the STI Lawman Review. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. And I'm back after a little bit of a delay. I had to go put a phone on silence. I could hear it in the next room ringing. The microphone probably didn't pick it up, but I did. Okay, let's talk about the STI lawman. First and foremost, I want to get the gun in my hand. I want to clear the gun because, yes, I have been carrying it. And now that the gun is cleared, I am ready to discuss it. Now, you may have heard me opening something and closing something. That was, that was a, uh, hmm, I'm trying to think of the, that was a plastic container that I use. I wanted to get a piece of 45 brass out. Well, let me give you some specs on the uh, STI Lawman. What I have here is the Lawman 5.0. The Lawman 5.0 uses a barrel bushing instead of a full barrel like the, I believe the 4-inch and 3-inch versions use. It is a carbon steel slide and frame. It's not a, it's not a cast frame. It has 30 LPI front strap serrations, and the trigger guard is undercut slightly, which is very similar to my Kimber TLE2, although the... Uh, serrations on the front strap on the TLE2 do feel a bit more aggressive. Now the uh, the front sight is fixed. The rear sight is turn adjustable. The factory grips have a unique and, in my opinion, uncomfortable grip pattern, but I'll move on to that later. It does have the classic 1911 slide serrations, although it does have them front and rear where the classic 1911's rear. I think these are a little bit finer than the classic 1911. As I've mentioned, it's a 5-inch barrel. It weighs in at 42 ounces, and the magazine it comes with has a rounded follower and has a 7-round capacity, giving the pistol its own 7 plus 1 capacity. Now, my first thoughts in the do not like category, the front sight, like, mm, me and this uh, keyboard for this Macintosh are not going to get along. I'll explain the Macintosh at the end of the show, possibly after the end, the end music. Okay. Front sights on this thing are black. There are no dots, no tritium inserts. They're just black sights. 
which I wouldn't mind it if it was just a, if it had a fiber optic front sight. And I keep threatening to get some orange paint or white paint, something bright, and paint the front sight. Another thing I don't like about it, just when I pick it up right out of the box, is the fact that the guide rod on it's a full length guide rod. I've never, I've never found a need for it on a full size 1911. But to each their own. Now I do have a. There were a few concerns when I first looked at it, and I wrote all my first concerns and first thoughts down overall. The fitment on this gun is extremely tight. I'm unsure, I was unsure what this would mean for reliability, but I also felt it should make for a very accurate pistol. The factory grips are pretty thin, and I'm, I was unsure how that would quickly affect, or how that would affect quickly gripping, drawing, and shooting. And the magazine has a rounded follower, and I was unsure as to how reliable that would be. And I'll address all these when I come back, when I come back and do, and talk about various things. Now the things I like about it, the fit and finish, you can tell they paid attention to detail on that. The machine work shows quality efforts. In fact, I'm, I want to say that very few, very few 1911s have this level of quality when it comes to machine work on a production level gun. Now, the rear sight is adjustable, and that's one thing I liked about it on my first impressions. I just wish the rear sight had tritium inserts or the front sight, along with the front sight, or if the front sight had been painted or had tritium inserts, or at least had a dot, something to make that front sight stand out. You know, my first shots with the gun, we put 30 rounds through it, me and my friend Ray, and I came to the conclusion that the factory grips, at least for me, were very uncomfortable, and it had a negative impact on the accuracy of the gun. I'm not kidding when I say I was shooting a pattern with this gun. I was not shooting a group. You now, the ma magazine, it functioned without issue in the first 30 rounds, and I lubed it just like the Kimber Custom TLE 2 was prior to its first 1,000 round test before doing this. And it was no surprise, but for the first 30 rounds, the gun ran without an issue. Well, after those first 30 rounds, uh, me and my buddy went home. We, uh, he went to his place. I went home. I cleaned it, and I decided, you know what would be a good way to break this thing in? We could give it a 1,000-round challenge like the Kimber TLE-2. So I took it down. I cleaned it just like I did the TLE-2. I lubed it just like I did again. And I also decided that these grips had, something had to be done about these grips. Well, my solution was I went online, I checked out a number of different places, and I finally decided I was going to go with a set of Crimson Trace. Uh, let's see here. I want to say it was the LG 401G laser grips. You know, these have the green laser in them. I think the LG 401 just has a red laser. And the grip pattern on these are more of a traditional style grip pattern. You now, with the gun cleaned and ready to be used, new grips installed, we went back to the range. We had few hundred rounds with us and we decided we we're going to put at least 250 rounds on the first uh, on the first day that we were going to make our thousand round attempt and I fired 250 rounds actually 255 because the first five rounds were factory ammo from the Kimber TLE2 1k test now during this 250 rounds of firing we had four operator induced failures these were we had a third party with us and he was a little small in stature, and he kept limp wristing the gun, and naturally this caused feed issues. We had two magazine-induced issues. That, um, that magazine was quickly identified, and we tested it with another firearm, and it continued to produce issues on that one. And we promptly dismantled that magazine and uh, salvaged, salvaged it. It was a bad spring, new spring in it, and I've run that magazine at the range since then, and it's worked just fine. But then... We had one failure due to out-of-spec ammo. It just it wouldn't feed into the gun. The uh, cartridge overall length was way out there. It was something like 1.831. If I no 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 no, I remembered that wrong because I just looked in my show notes. I actually have it here. It was 1.839, and that wasn't a reload. That was actually factory ammo that was that long. And for reloaders, you know that that you can pro you can probably go grab a manual and find that that's way long it shouldn't even been in the magazine but it was the first round and it kind of showed us something was going on then we had one failure we could not determine the cause of that particular failure and it was also a feed failure now we did abort the test due to impending failure because one the gun's ejection was getting weak the gun was getting too tight with the grind from the reloads to actually function reliably and we decided that well 
thousand round challenge on a brand new 1911 to this to this height of a tolerance probably wasn't going to happen effectively so we decided we'd restart the test once we had time to break it in a little bit so let me let me go back and address my first impressions now that I've fired the gun 255 shots plus the 30 from that first time in the do not like category the sights have not changed obviously and I still do not like the just black sights the full length guide rod hasn't provided any problems I will admit that but it hasn't exactly solved any problems either and uh, the concerns where the gun is very tight well yeah it is very tight and it only let it get a quarter way through the break through the thousand round challenge and you know ejection was so weak that the brass was literally hitting my shoe needless to say that you know tight tolerances you have to let the gun wear in as far as the grips well changing the grips out took care of that where on that first 30 rounds i was shooting patterns with the crimson trace laser grips i was shooting a very very tight hole you could have covered the hole at eight yards with a nickel you could have covered it with a quarter at 25 yards no it was 20 yards that we were shooting you could have covered it with a quarter changing the grips changed the comfort of the gun for me and the gun runs better than fine as far as the likes and the first thoughts well i forgot the magazine during our test the magazine did not have any issues needless to say that particular magazine is uh definitely going to be used in the future should it prove itself to be continue to prove itself reliable i'm one of those people i've got enough 1911 magazines i'm not worried about one magazine causing a problem as far as my first thoughts on things that i liked the fit and finish is still there it's still uh every bit as good as it was when i first got the gun the machine work hasn't changed any and the rear side is still adjustable so that hasn't changed either would i buy it again the answer to that is yeah is there anything I would do different if I bought the gun again? The answer to that is not really. I, I still would buy the Crimson Trace LG401G laser grips. I do like the fact that the gun has the, the slide stop is flush with the frame and the frame's beveled around where the hole for the slide stop pin to go pass through it is. And that means that, well, with most guns that have the Crimson Trace laser grips, you actually see a see the laser on the side of the slide stop when you turn it on on this one or the side of the pin where it passes through the frame you see it on this one you don't it doesn't affect this late it does not affect the accuracy of the laser and to me that's a benefit i like the fact it does not have an extended magazine really or not magazine an extended uh slide stop i like the fact that it does not have ambidextrous safety or ambidextrous magazine releases I like the beaver tail grip safety and the commander style hammer. And to be honest, I kind of like the style of hammer that it has, how it's been lightened. And normally I'm not a fan of these unique lightning for the triggers. But in this case, I kind of like this one. Overall, this is a gun that I would buy again. I would buy it again happily. I would not put it through a thousand round challenge and without uh, stopping and giving it a good break in beforehand. I didn't expect the gun to do well, to be honest with you, but I did not expect it to make it a quarter of the way through before it failed, and it didn't even fail. We could just tell failure was imminent. I suspect I know what was wrong with our unknown failure, but in the spirit of testing everything on another firearm, we took that unknown failure and fed it to the other gun, and it didn't have any problems in that gun, but that gun is a much looser tolerance gun. Now, the magazine that failed twice, well, that was a different and a magazine that I normally use for other guns and it was just the spring was weak 90% of the time I have a magazine failure I destroy that magazine occasionally I won't because the magazine has life left in it and I have like it's a spring that went bad instead of feed lips but once that magazine does have a failure it goes into the does not get carried rotation and the OE magazine did not have any failures did not have any problems so it's good there I really don't think anybody would have any reason not to want one of these if they are into 1911s. I know the price may, some people may be turned off by the price because, well, it's over $1,000. For that, I can get a Glock that's got plenty of room for improvement. I've never understood that. For me, buying this 1911 was more than just buying another gun. This was 
fulfilling a uh, fulfilling a wish to get a Texas made firearm that I've always wanted and the Lawman 5.0 was definitely on the list of acceptable models in fact I think it was the top of my list but anyways I'm rambling and I shouldn't be because I got a lot of news our news girl we'll call her Patty for this episode because she still won't let me mention her name but our news girl has one two three four five six seven eight eight stories for us that I she she put a note in here that she limited how many stories she decided to do and I had better not delete any of them so I won't on that note, let me run the audio clip that tells you how to get in touch with me. Then we'll come back, we'll hit the news, and we'll wrap the show up, and we'll go from there. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409 409- Two nine two six seven three six, and we're back. Okay, our first news story is in the in defense of self and others category. A Texas man was shot dead by an armed suspect at an Arlington, Texas Walgreens, when he retrieved a gun from his vehicle and attempted to stop the suspect who had shot the suspect's wife. The man got too close and allowed the suspect to slap his gun away before the suspect shot him. You know, a lot of people saw this story online in their news feeds because it was titled something like Good Samaritan Killed by uh, killed at Walgreens or something like that. Most of them had Good Samaritan in there, but this lesson shows us if you're not ready to use that firearm, don't put it into play. And if you are going to draw a firearm, do not get so close that your attacker can come into contact with the weapon and prevent you from using it. Moving on, our second news story, which is also in the in defense of self and others category. I'm not sure why she put the first one in this category, but she did. A license holder with a concealed handgun shot and killed an armed robbery suspect who also had a gun. The incident occurred at the League City McDonald's drive through lane, and only the suspect was harmed, according to reports. Now, the suspect uh, drew the gun on the driver and the driver's child. The driver did have a license to carry, so... You know, the suspect got what it had coming to him. In our criminal activity category, we have an article. I thought we covered it last week, but apparently we didn't. An employee at night transportation was killed by a relatively recent or killed by a recently terminated employee who came into the faculty with a firearm. Now, the suspect killed himself as well. So, that's how a lot of these always end, or how a lot of these end. And I'd also like to point out the suspect was armed with both a handgun and a shotgun, although he only used the shotgun. Moving on to Northwest Houston, two men were killed in what appears to be a drug ripoff attempt. The incident has been described as a gunfight between, or a gunfight with between 10 and 20 shots fired by three suspects. Police did not report any of the shooters were legally licensed to carry handguns either. Now, reading the article, my understanding was the first suspect was in his vehicle, and a vehicle with three suspects pulled up, locked him in. Two of the suspects got out of the second vehicle and the gunfight broke out between suspect one that was in his own vehicle, as well as suspects two and three who had gotten out of this vehicle number two. Moving on, we have a story where two Ellis County Sheriff's deputies have been arrested by the Texas DPS for theft from their evidence room. And this would be the deputy's evidence room and not the DPS evidence room. Among items reportedly stolen from evidence were firearms. Ellis County Sheriff Johnny Brown has said that he will not make a statement until the Texas Rangers have completed their investigation. Some folks would say, well, he's just covering things up. But you know what? He's making a smart decision here. It's best that, it really is best that he not make any statements because when you have a situation where people are being arrested and there's an investigation still ongoing, statements might actually cloud the investigation or complicate the investigation. Moving on to the political side of things, looks like we've got three stories here, and then we'll have this all wrapped up. Our first one is where students for concealed carry are working on documenting any cases of wrongful exclusion on the Austin campus of the University of Texas. I think we may have covered this story in the past. One option being considered is a cash prize for students who documents or for students who document the most verifiable cases of wrongful exclusion by faculty or staff. And while I think we covered this before, I cannot stress it enough that we need to we need to encourage students to document this. 
because even if it's not for legal action, it can help in the legislative process. Moving on, the University of Houston forced an art project to be altered because it featured a firearm. Now, while current law prohibits firearms on campus, and the campus can issue written regulations allowing some exceptions, like art exhibits, to be allowed. The University of Houston police chief said in an email, No guns are currently allowed on campus. We do not censor art. The art piece is currently being exhibited without the handgun. I'd say it's censored. And our third political news story, also college campus related. I wonder how that works. I don't know if it should have been politics or it should have been college campus. Uh, but the University of Texas regents are delaying their decision on the campus carry rules so that they can look into concerns that the rules may run afoul of various state laws, including the wrongful exclusion law. The Board of Regents has indicated that they may consider changing the proposed rules at the July board meeting. And this is one reason that we actually had the had the law written the way it was. Once the campuses got to create rules, it was better to have the Board of Regents, who would be dealing with the financial fallout, review the rules and maybe decide that, hey, this isn't going to work because we might get sued. Hey, I need to wrap this show up because I'm about to start sneezing. And I want to run the audio clip to tell that signs to show off. And after that, I'll come back and I'll, I'll mention my Mac comment. I'll actually go into detail about the Mac comment for as long as I can before my sinuses get too bad. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. Hey, is this thing still on? Hey, it is. Okay, back to the Mac comments. Oh, man. I'm, I'm actually recording this after I recorded the main portion of the audio for this episode. I recently acquired a MacBook Pro. I had a Logitech wireless mouse that goes to my regular production machine, or it goes to the wireless module for my machine. The same wireless mar- module allows me to run the keyboard for that production machine. And I also it have a uh, keyboard that I bought strictly for the Mac I decided since I'm doing a podcast I would like to use the Apple device for that you may be wondering why why would I use an Apple device since those that know me already know that I'm kind of a anti Mac person well I have a use for a device that is of this nature that I have to well in all honesty I don't have any options for PC-based systems, whether they're Windows or Linux-based, to do what I need. i got to have a Mac OS system to do something that I'm wanting to work on for a project. Well, the opportunity presented itself. I took it, and I bought the... I, I didn't buy the Mac. I traded for it. But I got the Mac. I got it set up. I've been using it a little bit, and I decided to use it for the podcast. A few less wires to store about the desk. So I've got this wireless keyboard for it that I just tossed to the side a moment ago. <clears throat> And also tossed it to the side when I was using the uh, when I was doing the main body of the episode, and I got the wireless mouse because I really hate trackpads. But overall, when I get this project done, I'll I'll kind of share it with people here if I ever get around to it. But part of that project is I really want to learn how to write. I want to learn how to develop iOS apps. I want to learn how to develop Android apps. And if I want to learn how to develop an iOS app, I'm or to any mobile app, I'm told that iOS apps are the easiest to learn how to develop. I want to start there. Now, any of the listeners have any Macintosh or iOS tips, feel free to let me know. With that said, I want to wrap this episode up, so please stay safe, carry responsibly, and keep the powder dry.